All right, we're back, and it's Comp 391, and it's week one, lesson one, part two. And now let's talk about a little bit of the history of gaming. Um, I'd like to bring it up, and I'm, I'm going to use this PowerPoint presentation again. I'm not going to read every piece of it, and I'm going to share this with you up on eCentennial, MyCentennial. You'll have it as a backup. Again, it's based on this book, um, Game, De Game Development Essentials. I'm just going to kind of maximize it here, and I'll switch out of it in one second, because it does some Microsoft does some weird stuff with my machine. But that's okay. Yeah, so this Game Development and Sessions is your book. That's the book that uh, from Jeannie Novak. Uh, she's written several books on game development. Um, and what I want this to do for you, and this reason why I'm following the book pretty much chapter by chapter, is because there's some really good pieces to it. Some really good information in there if you, if you, for you to understand games, right? Um, I'm also going to do some demos. Like, I want to talk about stuff um, as we move uh, through it. I'm not going to rush. So if we don't get through every single slide, don't worry about it, right? It's not about that. It's about us having discussions. So when I do some of this stuff, if you have a question, you have a comment to make, uh, I want to hear your own experience about games too, your own ideas, right? It's about that for me, right? So share that stuff with, with us so that way, you know, as we move forward, we, I understand where you're at, right? Uh, so I can help you progress. All right. Let's talk about the gaming industry. These are the um, the objectives. We're going to talk about milestones, um, a little bit about some of the pioneers in gaming. This will be the one and only history lesson you're going to get from me, right? We're not going to be talking about too much more history after this, right? Yeah, it'll be scattered throughout the book, like it'll talk about a few things where they came from, but more or less it'll be talking about examples of or uh, concepts around how to create games and requirements for some things. Like one of the requirements you'll have is like this game design document. We all need to know how to do that, right? When you go, it doesn't matter what uh, part of the uh, gaming industry you're going to, whether you're doing things like gamification for e-learning, uh, which is, you know, something that's becoming more marketable, although gamification these days is kind of a dirty word, because it's like, they, they tell you like this, if you do the, um, the critics will say this. Uh, by the way, who knows what gamification is? I'm bringing it up, throwing a term out there, you know what it is, what is it? Kind of, yeah, it's, it's what it sounds like, right? But it's it's like, who has ever done an e-learning e course, like an actual e-course online? Doesn't it suck, right? They're really boring, right, a lot of times. You go online and you have to follow, I mean, some, sometimes they're okay, right? I'm talking about a pure e-learning e course. If you do it in, in, uh, in business, like, for example, and I'm going to talk really dry material. Like, let's say um, they give you something to do on health and safety, right? You don't want to do this, right? This is like the most boring dry material you've ever had in your life, and you're ready to fall asleep, right? So imagine, it, the, and the, the flow is very, very boring as well. Even when they try and, and have, there's a, a lot of times they have someone narrating in the background nowadays. Uh, they've tried and spiced it up different ways. But the one, that, one way that works a lot is this gamification idea, where you actually, as you're learning, you actually get points. And it's almost like playing a game and, and learning at the same time. Now, it sounds like, you know, kid stuff. But truly, it's, it's, it's becoming something that's more and more, um, accept, acceptable in the, in, the, uh, in the industry, especially in, in areas like the government. Uh, government services do a lot of gamification. Uh, same thing with um, banks like RBC and CIBC and all those places. They want to make it so that employees are more engaged. So to improve engagement, they gamify everything, right? Um, I think it belongs everywhere. I don't think it's something that should be limited just to, um, to, to commerce and the industry. I think it should be something that we can even include here in school. So I'll be doing some of that myself. Like uh, one of the things I do when you do your tests is the first person who finishes gets 5% bonus. So I like, the, I like you guys to compete, right? So I'll be doing that every time, right? Um, because this is a gaming program already. Eh? So if you guys don't know how to play, that, we got issues, right? So we'll be doing that kind of thing uh, throughout. So we talk about these different, you know, where we came from, um, some of the pioneers. Let's talk about where, where, you know, the rudiments of where we came from way back in the day, uh, way before most of you were born, before I was born, right? And then go into something, we're going to bring us up to the present uh, today with this first section. Uh, and then tomorrow or Friday, we'll talk about a different section of, of, of information we're going to be talking about. Um, talking about more about platforms more than anything else. Okay, so again, way back in the day, they had these electromechanical kind of games. I want to focus on that word. By the way, anything that I put up on PowerPoint slides, anything I share with you on videos, it's all fair game for, uh, uh, for exam stuff. Eh? So if I talk about terms, if you see things that are, are, are uh, uh, 
bolded, chances are you might see that word again, right? Just FYI. Um, so when I talk about electromechanical games, I'm talking about pinball machines, all right? Think about these pinball machines way back in the day. Um, they were actually physically mechanical, mechanical pinball machines. You don't see that as much these days. There are a lot. There's more electronics involved in pinball machines than there ever were before, right? You might have a, a ball that runs around the pinball machine nowadays, but a lot of it, there's a computer underneath it all. Before, it wasn't like that as much. Like, literally, it was you hit something and, bam, a number came up, just like the old slot machines, right? And that's where they came from. So they started off like this kind of, um, these electromechanical games. Some of it was used, you know, to de-stress, right? So let's, how do I de-stress people? And, and like it says here, in military bases and, and different installations, they were, they were used so that way you could just relax, right? So games are used for that. Games are used for us to relax. How many people go home after a long day at school, right, and just, you know, chill out on, a, on, a, on your console, right? Anybody do that? I know I do. I go home and I just chill out. Sometimes I'm too stressed out about preparing all this stuff. You know, I get a little bit distracted. Right? And I, I start doing a little bit of whatever, right? Um, I do a little bit of, of gameplay. Who plays online? Who's, who's, a, you know, who's a big online? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a big thing now, right? It's a normal thing to play online, right? So, you know, why? Because it's more interesting, right? Who never plays games? If you guys are not a gamer, if you're not a gamer, I, I don't know. I, again, I question why you're here, right? You guys should be playing games all the time, right? One of the things I will be doing this, this semester is getting you to critique a game. I want you to take a game, play it, four hours, seriously, right? Won't be in a class, but it's an assignment, and you guys are laughing at me, right? But li literally, you go home, critique a game for four hours, come back with an assignment, it'll be worth 10%. Maybe this is one of the assignments I'll give you. And tell me what are the good things about it. Give me your honest advice, something that we can put on IGN, something you can put up anywhere, right? Just kind of say, this, is, this really sucked, right? Or this is really good, these are really good parts of the game, Maybe the story arc or something you like, the segues between scenes, whatever it is that you liked about the game. And this is really bad stuff. One thing I also want to get out of your vocabulary when we look at something, a few of you actually, when we do some presentations, we kind of share what we do here in the class. I never want to hear from your, from your mouth, it's good. Because that really, or, or even worse, it sucks. Those two words, it sucks and it's good, mean nothing to me. It's like when you're looking at art. You ever go to the museum? You look at someone and you say, that's pretty cool. I like, I like that. What does that mean to me? It means nothing to me, right? Give me more description. Tell me why you, why you think it sucks. Tell me why you think it's good, right? It goes back to that whole high school thing when they talk about, you know, um, interpreting and critiquing art. When we look at art, we look at anything. If you read a book, you can't just say, it's a good book, right? What does that mean to me? I don't want to know. what. I, tell me it's, a, it's an awesome game because, you know, we kick ass in the game. The graphics are awesome, right? You know, the timing is great, you know? Um, it gives a, a players uh, a really awesome way of sneaking around areas because the first person shooter and I like to you know I like to blow my guy the guy's head off and you know what it's really it's really super realistic I see the brain splatter on the wall when I kill a guy right or uh, you know what I, I can talk to the guy work it's it's great from a uh, from a multiplayer perspective it doesn't slow down you know these kind of things let's talk about functionality don't just talk about it's good it's good means nothing so please get that out of your vocabulary I want you guys to develop a way of looking at things. Games, code, whatever, and going, okay, I see what there's aspects of it that are good, and there are aspects of it that really they're not good, and here's why, right? But I digress. So again, these back in the day we had these electromechanical games and game machines, like literally stood up. Um, you know, I mean you you see the, there are smaller arcades these days. Who's gone to an arcade? Ever, right? Yeah. Well, there, that's what, all there was before. There wasn't any, you know, the consoles didn't have the same level of power as the arcade. You go to the arcade, there's some really cool arcade games you can play. Nowadays, you know, your, your whole computer's better, right? You have, you have a better time. A lot of us can play a lot of stuff at home that the arcade can't catch. Can't, you can't do anything. You can't compare, right? And, or it's similar. Where, you know, it's the same level of... of uh, the only thing that's a, that, that there's an advantage from an arcade, arcade perspective these days is... You're in that environment. And everyone's playing games together. That's one thing I always loved about the arcade. Back in the day when I was a kid, right, it was an escape. It was a place where we could go, like as a group of us, and kind of get lost. It was our world, right, when we played in the arcade. We spent a lot of time and a lot of money playing in the arcade because back then it was quarters, quarters, quarters. Now it's loonies and, and toonies, right? But before it was like, and there was no tokens, you know, for, for the first part. Later on they developed this whole token system where you put tokens into the arcade and played. But places like uh, Palladium and all that kind of stuff that, that exists today, that was all over the place. 
But they had lots of palladiums all over the place. Palladium is just the only survivor, right? Uh, kind of a named a name brand. Well, Chuck E. Cheese, too, if you, if you want to look at those, right? <laughs> if you're a little guy, right? But, um, you know, but that's you know, really, a, 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 you know, that's where we started off. These game machines um, is where we went to. But before the arcades, it came from somewhere else. It came from universities. It came from military installations. That's where these games came from. Military simulations. And um, really, at the end of the day, there was these two big companies. There was two big ways of going things, almost like two main game segments. One of them was, you know, you had these game rooms or arcades, and the other one ended up being, uh, as we went forward, uh, we developed almost like this home computer industry um, as well as consoles. That's kind of the way we went. But coin-op video was the way it all started back in the 70s, right? And it was huge. And lots of movies have been made about this, eh? Like Tron. We're going to talk about Tron. Who's ever watched Tron? Like the old one. The original. Ah, you put your hand down. Right? Tron, actually, the first Tron movie came from the Tron video game. Like, it was, like, way out there. Right? Um, so, you know, again, it, it started out as a place to meet. Remember, this is before cell phones, before the Internet, before fax machines, before any of that stuff. I lived in that era. When you called your friend, you didn't call him on the cell phone. You called him at home, right? And you said, hey, man, I'll meet you on the corner, right? And when you went to the corner, if he wasn't there, right, you hung out for 20 minutes and you said, damn, he's not showing up. Because there's nothing you can do. You can't call him. He's on the road somewhere. You don't know where he got. He got lost, right, this guy. So then you go to wherever you're supposed to go together and whatever. Sometimes it's at the coffee shop or whatever. But there's nothing like that. So where are you going to meet? You're going to meet at the arcade. You're going to go to the mall, right? I guess people still do that. They still go to the mall. Right, but they go to the arcade, and the arcade was like a place to hang. It was a place that you were, you know, you're competing, and you see this new game that's playing, right? One of the things I love to do is I used to go to the movies a lot, and then next to the movie there was an arcade, and they did a lot, you know, they, and they kind of still do that today. Actually, if anything, the independent movie theaters that used to exist before Cineplex took over everything, right, way back in the day, right, they used to have independent movie theaters all over Toronto, right, and next to them, Every single time, there was some little arcade that you could kind of hang out with before the movie, right? Cineplex took that idea, and that now, if you don't look at Cineplex, every one of them has an arcade inside of them, right? That's where it came from. And that came from the, the U.S. model. They did kind of the same thing back then. Um, <clears throat> again, we started with these mainframe computer games. Because remember, computers, when I say mainframe computer games, the computers that I probably have in my watch right now, it's, it's probably like, I don't know, 64K on my watch, right? It was like a whole room, 64K before. That's how big it was to house 64K, um, you know, of memory, right? Um, and my watch is dumb. My watch just does the time, right? And a little bit of stopwatch, right? Yeah, that you couldn't even get in a machine that was like this big. It's massive. Now, I know you think that's crazy, right? But things have really sped up since when I was a kid. Like we're talking about in the 70s and 80s, right? Um, and you got to frame it for yourself. Star Wars is coming out this, this year, again, by the end of the year, right? And Star Wars in 1977 is the same time that we were playing video games when it first came out uh, in 77. Um, and it was around the same time. Everything was kind of happening at the same time, building up around that time. I swear to God, I'm not going to talk about history too much after this. After today, I'm not going to talk about how old I am and all the games I used to play. Well, maybe not as much. All right. And here's kind of a timeline. I like this. This comes right out of the book. Again, way back, you had this kind of arcade game idea. It moved into these cartridge-type games, you know, as we moved into the 80s, right? And by the 90s, we had finally some kind of handheld device that we had. We're going to talk about this. We moved from this 8-bit architecture to 16-bit architecture. This is kind of cool, right? And 16-bit um, was huge, right? I know that sounds crazy, but it was like, like literally what a jump in performance we had from playing games, like huge. Um, and then we moved into the 32 and 64-bit games. Between This is kind of a funny period, this 94 to 99 to 2000 kind of thing, where things were changing a lot. And even computers, like, you know, we moved in from, from Windows 95, we moved into, like, you know, Windows XP, you know, over the 90s, and finally into, into something like Windows 7 or Windows Vista. Oh, I'm saying that word, it's, it's just killing me, right? But it was moving from this 32 to 64-bit architecture back in the day, right? So the same thing was happening on the video games and from a console perspective, even from, from uh, machines that existed in, um, 
uh, in arcades. They were moving the same way too. You saw a lot of awesome stuff in the arcades that you couldn't afford to have at home. Not so today, right? Again, as you kept on moving more and more uh, into the 2000s, as you see, we got you know different motion sensing apps. That was kind of the, the revolution when we came out with their wand, right? And then finally, Microsoft kind of, um, uh, they have the, uh, I keep on, I have it on my, on my bloody uh, console. What's it, what the hell is it called? The Kinect. Thank you very much. See, the word just was escaping me. And that's kind of cool. Even the Kinect 2 that they came out with, with this uh, Xbox One idea. Um, where you actually don't have a physical device that you're waving, but you know um, the the computer or, or console is can detect your position in space. That's kind of cool, and we're going to get more and more, especially with Microsoft's announcement of the Hololens uh, earlier um, within the last six months. And to me, you know, that's that's where we we're going to go. I mean, 3D 3D games and even 3D TV nowadays, um, it's something that's happening more and more. I have still yet to see too many people with 3D TVs at home that actually use that. A piece of it, right? And let's face it, most of us either download our content or are on Netflix or something like that, right? Stream it, download it. Um, and more of us are moving away from traditional um, entertainment the way we have it today, right? Um, I mean, think about Steam and what that represents for us, you know, compared to what it used to be before. We used to have to go, all you could do is go buy games. Now you can buy everything online, everything. You want a, you want a game? You can download it today and, and, and play it and ready to go, right? And before it wasn't possible. First of all, download speeds would not support it, right? That's the one thing you have to think about. In my day, when I first started off back in the day when I was a kid, like I'm talking about when I, mean, I was 10, 11, um, the best speed we had was a dial-up modem, right? And that was like one out of every thousand households might have something like that. Not everyone had a dial-up modem, and it was really slow. I had a tape drive, right, instead of a hard drive, right? So you got to see how it moved on. That was with the Commodore 64 and the Amiga after that. So as you moved into more technology, it's almost like if I tell you today, guys, let's build a teleporter, right? I want to teleport. I want to move from one place to the other place instantaneously. What are the micro technologies that I need to make a teleporter? Well, I need to be able to go down to the quantum level to, you know, kind of analyze by my cells at a quantum level. Do we have that technology today? Absolutely not. We don't have that, right? So we need that first. And how about this? Somehow, the ability for us to, you know, whack out physics so that way when I teleport to one, from one place to the other, right, the Earth is moving and the, the universe is moving and everything is shifting, but somehow I've got to make an adjustment that quickly so that way I don't, like, teleport into the ground or in space somewhere or in, increase my uh, kinetic energy so that I heat up and burn when I kind of, like, teleport from one place to the other, right? These are things we need to do, right? So we can't just make a teleporter. Same way we can't just make the video games we have today. We have to come from somewhere. We started off really big, and we've moved really small, right? And we're going to continue to move microscopic, right? We're going to go into the place where maybe the computer is going to be part of us, and then gaming is going to be something different than we have today. I know it's scary. And maybe we're going to get more and more involved with AI, right? Where we're going to play against the computer a lot more, and AI is going to be a lot more intelligent, right, than it is today. Today, we still are playing with AI that's very rudimentary, right? It's silly, right? If, if anything, we can mostly outthink AI, right, if you think about it. We can plot it, we can predict it, we can move around it, right? If you play a game long enough, you can beat the game. Tomorrow may not be the case. The AI may be like a real player out there. He might make his mistakes, but he won't make any mistakes, or she. So this timeline, the reason why I like the timeline, it kind of gives you a scope of how things have changed. From 1972, or in the 70s, to 2014, 2015, this year, right? It's really come a long way. Like huge, and it's not happening in a very. It's a very short timeline. It's a kind of drop in the bucket in terms of time frame, right? Uh, in terms of technology, and all the other ancillary technologies around this, nothing to do with gaming, fax machines, cell phones, the internet, all that kind of stuff, happen all at the same time. Movie technology, special effects, camera technology. I mean, everything. All these things were needed to build our teleporter, right? There was no way to get there without going through all these messy steps in between. Okay. Um, again, video game really talks about everything that we do. When we say video game, the word the words video game, we know what it means. When we play games on the computer, we say video game, it still applies today. It applies to everything, every kind of game. But there is a difference between, you know, something like a, um, I mean, there's different kinds of games you can play nowadays, right? Um, and one of, our, one of the jobs we have as developers, how do I translate a game that I have that's physical like, let's say, who plays Magic? Whoever played Magic, 
a card game, right? Um, or Pokemon, right, or something like that. And now you want to transfer that into, like, you know, an online game. That's it becomes more challenging, right? It kind of there's a feel that you lose when you're playing physical card games than when you're playing, you know, Magic Online, as an example, right? Or what about if you played, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and you play a role-playing game against another player, but not like a like a tabletop style game, right? It just still doesn't quite have the feel of what it has when you're physically in front of someone. It's getting better, right? And they wrap it around this different three-dimensional universe these days, or at least a three-quarter down kind of universe that they use in, in, uh, uh, in Diablo and so on, right? But really, at the end of the day, we try and translate an idea we have in our head, right, into something that we call a video game today, right? Um, something that we've seen before, something we've played before, like chess. Like chess was a huge game, right? In the, back in the day, having an electronic chess game that can play against you, I was like, unheard of, unspeakable, right? We just we saw that on Star Trek the week before, right? Spock was playing against like, you know, three, he was playing three-dimensional chess. We're like, hey, I can play chess at home. This is a big revolution back then. Nowadays, chess is like, you know, you, we, we, we all could write an algorithm for chess. It would take us some time, maybe a few months, but we could probably write our own, right? Um, and the same thing goes with other kind of algorithms that you might be chosen, you might choose to write or, or be challenged to write. Like, for example, um, can you think about writing an algorithm for uh, something like Sudoku, which is a little bit easier. Who's played Sudoku before? Right? Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad that you guys have done it. You might think that's easy, uh, an easy algorithm to build. It's not. It takes a little bit of thinking. And the stuff that you've learned right now with Comp 100 doesn't cut it. <laughs> you need to do more stuff uh, in order for you to make a game like Sudoku, right? Why? Because there's almost like this faux AI that's out there to convert something that you can write down physically with a pen, you know, um, and convert it into a video game. And video games take on different forms now. It's not just, thank God, it's not just desktop games, but a lot of mobile games. One thing I was really disappointed with with Microsoft um, before they came up with the announcement for Windows 10 is that, and last year they came up with the Surface and all this kind of stuff, is like, why couldn't they make it so that I can take my Xbox with me, right? Why can't I play my Xbox games that I can buy from the store, any Xbox title, on a movable game, like some kind of tablet that I go, I have, a, I have a controller, I set my tablet up, bang, I'm playing. Why can't I do that, right? I have to have my Xbox. It's a massive thing, man. I can't want to take my Xbox on, uh, on the road. And nowadays, this way it enables gamers to play games anywhere. But with Windows 10, they're looking at some kind of app that allows you to play, or at least uh, view Xbox games, or control Xbox remotely. I don't know how it's going to work out with Windows 10, we'll see. But at least we're getting there. And I think this is the kind of the future of consoles. Consoles are going to disappear. I think in the future you're going to have a console on the go. It's not going to be a handheld, not exactly. But something where you have almost like this whole console experience we have today. I'm not sure what the, what the form is going to take, whether it's going to be HoloLens or something else like that. Um, and again, wearables now get, nowadays get this like kind of a bad name because of uh, Google Glass. Hey, three years ago I was like, Google Glass, awesome. Now it's like Google Glass, right? It's not cool, right? Um, and even HoloLens today, I'm like, that's pretty clunky for HoloLens, right? That's pretty big. That's a pretty big thing to go around your head. I don't like things around my head too big. They got to be as small as glasses, like the guys who wear glasses in the room. When it becomes that small or a contact lens in your eye, then it's going to be cool to have 3D, like holography or whatever. But anyways, I digress a bit. So let's talk about this arcade phenomenon a little bit. Again, it started with these pinball machines, and then it moved into into this um, these you know, quarters that we put into this this arcade game that would use um, very, very simple technology at the beginning. This is what it kind of looked like way back in the day. Um, this game was Space War. It, I'll be honest with you, it predates me. I've seen it, like the actual physical machine, but I never played this game, right? And again, you had a series of buttons um, and everything else. And then, again, this is the beginning of Atari, right? And some of these big uh, traditional gaming um, companies out there. Um, and that's that's really how they started. They started off with these big, I'll say, I'll, I'll call them like big ass arcade games. Like they're just massive, right? And you'd have to play them. They were unaffordable by by regular consumers. You could not have this in your house unless you were rich, right? Nowadays, you know what? I think you still can't have it unless you're rich. If you ever go to Costco and try and want to buy one of these things, it still costs like five grand, right? Something crazy like that. Uh, if I'm going to spend five thousand dollars to have a, a, a you know just a, a shell and then a little bit of a computer behind, you can build your own, man. For that kind of money. You can buy the case nowadays and you can download something called MAME. Hey wait, MAME. You guys ever play MAME? Play with MAME? 
the original ROMs of all the arcade games in the 70s and 80s are available online today, right? Any game like Pac-Man or anything that I talk about here is available. You can download it and install it on your machine today, pretty much, right? One of my favorite games is Star Trek, right? The Star Trek game they used to come up with. It uses two paddles, right, way back in the day, and we, I used to play it at Wonderland when Wonderland was just new, when it just first came out with Canada's Wonderland. Um, so that's one of the kind of games. Atari had this kind of up and down um, thing where they they came up with you know um, different video games. It was starting to catch in in the early seventies. It was really really um, I would say popular, you know, to actually have a couple. There's only a couple of arcade games. Pong was a big one, man. Pong, where you just like it was like table tennis. Pink, pink. That's all. It was just uh, with a thing that just goes kind of back and forth between two paddles. That's all it was. It was huge. I know you guys are like. Pong? How could that be huge? There's no color to it. There's not complicated sounds. And you stood up and you just played the same game all day. But that's all we had, right? Just like we didn't have cell phones. Now you guys are all spoiled. You got to have all kinds of great stuff that's uh, portable. You've seen all kinds of awesome games. From a console perspective, we didn't have that when we were kids. And here's an example of what Pong would look like if you haven't seen it. And again, to me, uh, you know, it definitely... Is something that you, you can learn from. Hey, try and make a Pong game today, right? You can probably do it. And especially with try and make it with a tool like Blender. You could probably do that too, making Pong with Blender. But how do we create, you know, kind of convert this three dimensional world from Blender into 2D? You can do that. We'll talk about that. How to create a Pong game with Blender with no code, zero coding, right? Let's do that today if we can. Um, Asteroids is another big game. Uh, that's something you can download today. You can. There's tons of examples of making asteroids for the web, uh, for different languages. By the way, I know how to you know program in a, a variety of different languages, which I, I suggest to you as a developer you need to do, uh, especially things like today you need to know JavaScript. JavaScript is like the new Java, right? Um, Java, I know how to program in Java, C Sharp, C++, Objective-C, Swift. I've even picked that up lately. Meh, it still needs some, uh, some time in the oven, in my opinion, right? Um, Name it, I probably programmed it. Pascal, some older languages, right? Uh, languages that have died, like, for example, COBOL. I used to do COBOL. I'm, I'm not proud of it, but I used to do it, right? But a lot of these, these games, these, uh, this arcade game, um, Asteroids, actually was available in a lot of these earlier languages, especially in things like Assembly. Actually, Assembly was the first language that I learned to make games back in the day when the pet computer was out with only 4K of RAM and no hard drive. Um, again, they use these vector graphics. This is kind of the revolution. When we first saw, when I first saw asteroids back in the day, I was like, wow, it's actually moving and, and you can explode them. How do they do that, right? I didn't understand the concept of sprites when I was a kid, but that's where the, the original concept of sprites came out. These vector sprites that would come out and every time, you know, you'd have a collision, it would have collision, simple collision detection at the, at the, uh, um, the pixel level, right? And when you have collision detection, then it, as soon as you collide with something, it, it brings up another sprite to make it look like it's exploding, but really it's not. A lot of games that we, all the stuff that we write with for games, they're all tricks. That's another thing you have to know, right? If you don't know how, know that already. If you do something with 2D games, a lot of times it's just illusions that we're creating for the player. And we're, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about a little bit of 2D, stuff you're going to need from a, from a 2D perspective, and stuff for 3D. And they're all tricks, every one of them. Galaxian. I mean, we moved away from um, this whole idea with Space Invaders, where you had a bunch of stuff moving across the screen. They called this slide and shoot games. Slide to left and right. That's what they would do. They would just go like a heartbeat, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump. They're fired down at you, and that was the original game. Hey, man, that was huge improvement over over uh, something like an Asteroids game, right? And they came up with a bunch of different games, different sequels. They were very successful. Galaxian was one of my favorite games in the arcade. Nowadays, again, you could download and install Galaxian on your iOS device or Android device, no problem, right? And there's, a, there's all kinds of clones of Galaxian out there that you can download for free, right? Back then, we used to spend all of our, uh, our quarters on Galaxian. Um, game violence was big, eh? 1975 was where it first started off with Death Race and Death Race 2000. It was actually a movie um, with David Carradine. And this is before you guys, but Sylvester Stallone, you know, he was... Uh, he was a big actor back then. He's pretty much, you know, still recognizable now. Um, 
especially with all the stuff he's come out with lately. But a lot of violence, and they started to import these things into the video games, and it was the first time they've ever done that. Like today, with um, automatic cars. Cars can drive themselves today. And a lot of places in the States and in Canada don't know how to deal with it. They don't have rules around um, what happens when you when the car drives itself. What kind of rules should there be? Should, be? should you be sober? Should you have a wheel, a hand on the wheel when you drive a car that drives itself? Like, you know, what are the rules? Back then, the same thing happened with video games. Mm -hmm. What happens when we put death and violence in a video game? That never happened before until 1975, right? So they banned it. They banned it. At the beginning, it was death race wasn't allowed to be played anywhere. It was huge. It was actually almost like a, um, it became a game that the rich kind of had in their house because they could have it. Almost like Faces of Death, the movie, right? You know, they wanted to have, only certain people could see this kind of crazy stuff. It's almost like the human race has always been chasing death, you know, and destruction and sex for a long, long time, right? And again, back in the 70s, you know, you got to understand what was going on then. And I can't put it in two words. There's no way I could speak just one hour about what happened in the 70s, but it influenced a lot of the stuff we do today. So, game violence. Activision came up with their, um, it was a, a bunch of employees, and this is going to happen a lot of times too. You have a, you're an indie developer, you get together with your buddy in your garage or in your basement nowadays, you make your game company, and then one day your buddy says, see ya, and makes his own. <laughs> it happens, right? Creative differences, because, you know, you want to do different things, and this is what happened with these bunch of Atari uh, employees that left, and uh, they created this game company, Activision. And Activision cre created their own um, consoles and everything else. And uh, they wanted they named their company. This is kind of a neat fact. Named their company Activision uh, because it came before alphabetically before Atari, right? Um, and of course, Atari. The name Atari itself came from the move and go, right? Which means check, almost like check and chess. That's what it came from. Pac-Man was huge. You guys ever played Pac-Man? still exists today, some places. Again, you have your little... One thing that happened was you had this human interface, this joystick for the first time, a multi-directional joystick that you can kind of move around the screen with your Pac-Man. And it was also in color, which is huge, right? Remember, we're talking about back in the day where everything was black and white, or white and black. Like, literally, the, the background was all black, like this, and then you had some kind of white things on the front, and that was all. So color, Galaxian, Pac-Man, all this stuff, um, it became really huge and popular. And, I mean, again, you had, this is neat. It started introducing with, pa with Miss Pac-Man, and I want to mention this, I kind of put this in here because I thought it was important in terms of story. I know this is kind of simple, uh, simple right now, but Miss Pac-Man actually had segues between one level and another, just like we have cutscenes today, right? So we play a game and also uh, some kind of cutscene. And it looks like uh, very cinema, um, almost like a, you know, from a film or whatever. And you move from one scene to the next. They had that kind of thing back in the day with Miss Pac-Man. So it's not like it's never been done before. We just do it better now. Well, we do it differently now. Um, a lot of stuff happened with graphics in terms of the way we scroll. Like here's an example of this first original um, Space Invaders. I'll be okay. Then we moved to Centipede, where you had different kinds of human interface controls with a roller ball. I don't know if you've ever seen this, in, the, in the, uh, where you have a kind of a roller, you roll the ball around, and you, that's the way you move across the screen in, um, in any direction. And then, of course, uh, Xevious, or any one of these um, kind of um, uh, plane games, where you had kind of a top-down scroller, where it would continue a continuous scroll kind of game, right? Or even a side scroller. Like, these are big things. Actually, we do side scrollers and top-down scrollers in my web uh, 397 course. It's one of the things we learned how to build from scratch. But, um, but a lot of these games, new concepts in gaming, how to, how to present games, um, even the first platformers that came out with Donkey Kong, right? It's funny, the word donkey, the reason why it was called Donkey and Kong, well, they kind of mixed between this idea of um, King Kong, right, way back, and stubborn. The, the, the word stubborn for, for Japanese, right? They kind of translated stubborn to someone like, like something like a donkey. Well, donkeys are stubborn, right? And Kong could mean ape. So it came from like stubborn ape, stubborn ape, Donkey Kong, right? And it became, it kind of ca uh, caught, right? Donkey Kong be be became the first time we ever saw Mario, 
right? The whole Mario Brothers, Mario the, the character, and Mario kind of became Nintendo's um, mascot. And I'm going to just kind of pause it here from an ancient history perspective, and we're going to get back to this on, on the Friday and talk more of this ancient history stuff. And I want to take about a five-minute break right now, uh, do a little bit of stretching and go to the washroom, smoking for those people who have to do that, and then we'll get into Blender.